I want to talk about uh, imperative versus functional programming, but the question is, which one should we really choose? And uh, one of the things I would start by saying is, the worst way to do just about anything is to believe there is one way to do anything. And, and that is the key, is really to keep in mind, is that not to carry our biases or carry our, uh, you know, wishes to do something and saying, that's the only way to do. What, what's really important is to really consider a lot of these things as tools. And when you have tools, you want to choose the right tool for the right job based on various factors and various environments, various conditions that, that we are working with. And uh, I have a number of friends whom I really respect a lot. And they would tell me functional programming is the only way to write code. We are still good friends. We still meet for dinner. We just don't agree on that. And does, does that mean that functional programming is not something we should do? No, I'm a big fan of functional programming as much as anything. But at, the, but at the same time, though, it's really important for us to keep in mind that these are tools. That's what it really is. And when you have tools, you need to really employ the right tool for the right job. And also, it, imagine for a minute, you have a person knocking at the door and you ask them what they are there for, and they are telling you that they are there to fix up plumbing, and all they have is a hammer on their hand. And you say, well, great, thanks for coming, but what do you have as a tool? And they say, I have a hammer. And then they whack at something and say, that's the only tool I need, I don't need anything else. That would be kind of scary, right? You probably would shut the door and call the cops, not let the person in. So you don't want somebody to just use a tool because they believe that's the right tool or only tool they will ever use. So it's important to really be able to be accommodative and find the right tools that we can use. And to me, imperative style of programming or functional style of programming is really that kind of a tool. One more thing to consider is there are times when people make a statement saying, oh my gosh, I cannot believe we will use object-oriented programming, we should use functional. And I think that's, again, misguided. Because I don't really see pitching object-oriented programming against functional programming. I see them a lot orthogonal to one another rather than being against each other. For example, if you look at several languages that are out there, you are going to see that a lot of languages are really uh, about mixing the paradigm. Scala, Ruby, Python, Kotlin, C Sharp, I know, C++, JavaScript, keep going, keep mentioning language names. Every single one of those languages do both object-oriented and functional style of programming. It's very interesting how languages became evolved to become a hybrid languages where you can do imperative, object-oriented, and functional programming all together. So, and to me, that is where the power is for us, the programmers, is to really choose what makes sense to solve our problem rather than just saying this is the only way to do things. But let's talk about these concepts a little bit to understand what these things really mean. So let's talk about the imperative style of programming. What does it really mean to be imperative style? Now, I'm going to be using Java as an example, mainly because a lot of us use Java. And generally speaking, I firmly believe in never solving an equation with more than one variable in it. So if I'm going to try to teach you a syntax of a language you're not familiar with and a concept along the way, you're going to lose both of them. And neither me nor you gained anything. So I usually take on everything that's the same except that one thing I want to focus on. And in this case, I really want to focus on the difference in paradigm, so I'm going to choose the language most of us are familiar with. If I'm teaching you a language, of course, that's a different story. And the reason I say that is I just replied to a tweet and somebody said, well, I really enjoyed your talk yesterday on you know, using functional programming for a game of life, but I'm disappointed to use Java. My reply was, I'm really disappointed that you're disappointed. Because the point really is, we don't want to be fanatic about programming languages. I perfectly, it's OK to, for you to love a language, but you don't have to throw trash on some other language for that reason. These are tools, and it's important to keep that in the mind. 
So essentially, in this particular case, I want to start with a little example here of, let's say, a names is equal to, I'm going to say, a list of, let's say, in this case, some names I want to bring in. And then given these names, let's say, I want to know if our good friend Nemo is actually in this collection. So what would you do in the imperative style of programming? In the imperative style, you, you tell what to do and also how to do it. So essentially, this is where you tell what to do and you also tell how to do it. So this is where pretty much an imperative style comes in. So to solve this problem, what am I going to do? I say Boolean found, uh, sorry, Boolean found is equal to false because I haven't found it. And if found is true, I'm going to simply say, for example, I could simply output, oh, maybe Nemo found, uh, and maybe play a nice, uh, you know, exciting music, or maybe say Nemo not found, and maybe we can play a sad music. But then how do we say whether we found Nemo or not? You can say for int i equal to zero, i less than names dot, is it length, is it size, is it count? Because if there was one way to do it, it will be consistent, and we should never be consistent in the field of software development, right? But that's going to become really a complex code to write, and, and I would say that is complex. Now, one of the key things to keep in mind is you say, wait a minute, you just said complex, but that's a simple for loop. Now, this is something for you to keep in mind. Words are important when we use them, right? So this is a familiar but a complex loop. So I want to emphasize that. Do not confuse familiar with simple. So a lot of times we do this. We confuse familiar with simple. We say, oh, that's a simple for loop. Well, no, not really. It's not a simple for loop. It is actually a complex for loop, but we are familiar with it. And, and what happens, though, is our mind is wired to say that familiar is less threatening to us. So we think that it's simple because we are comfortable, we are used to it. Something that is unfamiliar, it's in our DNA. Something that's unfamiliar, we try to push it away. Because, oh my gosh, what if that causes problem for me? What if it threatens me? So we consider unfamiliar to be complex and familiar to be simple. But it may not be the case. But of course, in this case, this is complex, I said, but there's a simpler, relatively speaking. And you can say name coming from names, if you will. And in this case, what am I going to say? If name equals to Nemo, and you may even ask the question, should I use a double equals or a dot equals? That's a how. That's a how as well right there on that line, isn't it? Then you say, if that is equal, then I'm going to say found is equal to true. But then you, as an observant reader, you say, hey, you're forgetting one step here. You better call a break. And what is that? That's a how as well, isn't it? If you don't break, depending on the problem you're trying to solve, you may get a wrong result or a slower result, or the, whichever the case may be, or wrong and slower, potentially. So these are the details you need to focus on to get things working. And of course, when you execute the code, you can see that Nemo was found. But that is an imperative style of programming. So what are the smells of imperative style? You often have what are called garbage variables. So what are garbage variables? Garbage variables are variables that you use to solve a problem, but the problem itself doesn't need it. I, I know what you're thinking, right? As I'm writing this code, you're thinking, come on, Venkat, we don't write code like that. We normally say Boolean T, right? Not Boolean found, or if at all, temp, because that's the way we tell these variables you don't deserve to live. And we're using this because we have other no choices. That's a sign of garbage variable, right? So in this case, the found is a garbage variable because that's not needed from the problem. It's needed from the, uh, uh, in the solution. That, so it typically has garbage variables. It also has, you can say, mutability. And, and you can see that we are mutating variables oftentimes in general. 
And we also, if you notice, is it's verbose. It is hard to read. Here is one thing I would want, I'll come back to this in a minute. It's verbose, it's also error prone, and really hard to parallelize. So if somebody looks at this code and, and tells you, I want you to parallelize this code, you only have two choices, right? To either cry or to laugh, because it's not something you can do so easily and incredibly hard to parallelize. But here's one thing I've observed. This is mainly because of familiarity, right? A lot of us have written code in imperative style ever since we started programming. You know, I spent about 35 years writing code so far, and I'll be absolutely honest, in the 35 years, I spent a good part of about 20 years writing code in imperative style. And then I said, oh my gosh, people talk about functional programming, and I want to really learn it. But that journey was not easy. And when I started learning it, it made it even harder when people said, this is really easy. It's like, no, because I have to think differently. It's a paradigm shift. And when you do, it becomes really hard. So because of the familiarity, I would say it is, I would say in general, it is easier to write due to familiarity, uh, you could say, but hard to read uh, due to verbosity, moving parts, and so on and so on and so on that you can keep adding. So this is the trick in imperative style. It's easy to write often, but code is written once, but it's reread many, many, many times and rewritten or refactored or revised many times. So don't optimize code for writing one time. Optimize it for rewriting and evolving and changing. That is extremely important for us to consider. So that's basically the imperative style we saw. But what is declarative style? Declarative style is where we tell, so let's, let's define what that is. So declarative style is where we tell what to do, but not how to do it. So you want to tell what to do, but not how to do it. So notice what I'm going to do in this code. I'm going to get rid of most of this code, that loop and everything, and I'm going to say names.contains Nemo. So essentially, I call contains, and it tells me Nemo is there. I told what to do, not how to do it. How do I do it? Contains. I delegate to the contains. Question for you, and don't hesitate by being right or wrong. Can anyone guess, and don't look up quickly on your computer, can anyone guess the implementation of contains? What was that? Sorry. Oh, hash code and equals. Maybe it's really performant. Hash code and equals. Great. I like that answer. Any other answers? A linear, just the loop that we saw, maybe. Index off, maybe. I'll tell you the answer I like the most. Comparing, that's not the answer I like the most. <laughs> I'll tell you the answer I like the most. I don't care. You say, how rude, Venkat. I apologize for that. Let me say it differently. It's encapsulated. What does that mean? I don't care. Sell politely, right? So encapsulation. You say, but, but wait a minute, though. We do care as programmers. What if I'm concerned about performance? What if I'm concerned about side effects? What about, what about? And that's the difference. In the first example you saw, the details are on your face. You have no escape. It drags you in, beats you down, crushes you, and holds you down under the water and says, you have to endure this. To know anything, you have to know everything. That's what imperative style is. In order for you to know anything, you got to know everything. It pours it on you and says, go figure it out. Read through it. The declarative style says, Let's work on abstraction. There are things you don't need to know. Not that you shouldn't know, but you don't need to. And 
hey, how do I do this? Look for contains. How does contains works? That's a next level of detail. This is called slap, single level of abstraction principle. Single level of abstraction principle says your code relies on one single level of detail, one single level of abstraction. So when you look at this code, what am I focusing on? I want to know if the word is found, and if it is, what am I going to do with it? I don't care how to find that word. And that's delegated to a level of abstraction, single level of abstraction principle. So that's basically the idea of declarative style. That takes us to functional style. So what is functional style? I'm going to list that right here. So what is then a functional style? So you can say a functional style is equal to declarative style plus the use of higher order functions. So this is really where what a functional style really gets to. So functional style is declarative style plus the use of higher order functions. So you are then formulating your application using composing functions that you can work together. Well, that begs the question though, what are higher order functions? Higher order functions basically are where you can say much like how we pass data, we can pass code or functions around these functions that can either receive or return, you can say, functions are called uh, higher order functions. So higher order functions really are functions that can return functions or functions that can receive functions. So just like how we can do object decomposition, we can do functional decomposition as well. So we can put together functions that create other functions inside of them and can aggregate them, and you can build blocks of functions to create bigger functions if you want to. So functional style is declarative style plus the use of higher order functions. That's basically what functional style is. So in this case, you can ask the question, what's the problem with imperative style of programming? The imperative style of programming, like I mentioned earlier, drags you down and beats you down. For example, if you think about a very simple situation, I want to, let's say, print all names in uppercase, comma, separated, uh, you know, of length, let's say, of length, let's say, in this case, four. How do you do that in imperative style? You can say for a name coming from names, you can then say in this case, uh, uh, if the name dot length, let's say, is equal to four, then you can say, you know, print out, and I want them comma separated, a name dot uh, to uppercase. And you can even throw in a plus comma but you notice the comma is sticking in the end when you're done with this, unfortunately, isn't it? So as you loop through this, you're gonna find, unfortunately, that the comma is appearing in the very end of this. And how do you get rid of that comma? You're gonna put a lot more detail into a minor part of this code. You are focusing on the wrong parts. When you focus on the wrong parts, what happens? You waste your time on the wrong parts rather than the gains you really want to achieve. That's where it drags you down, beats you down with all the details. And this is where we get into this analysis paralysis. We lose sight of the problem we are trying to solve. And we get really tangled up into the details. Instead, well, when you run the code, it still didn't produce the right result. You're going to write more code to remove just that comma, more code and more time. Or you can say, Hey, here's an idea. Why not simply say that names.stream.filter, given a name, give me a name.length is equal to four, dot map, a string to uppercase. Then I'm going to say uh, collect, and I will ask it to join based on a comma. So this gives us a result of that particular call which I simply want to, let's say, output like so. So in this case, what's going to happen? 
you can see right in here, I'm going to go ahead and bring up, in this case, the collectors API. So now if we go back to this code and run the code, what do we, what do we see as an output in this particular call? So we are asking it to take a stream, perform the map, perform the uh, filter for the map, and we collect joining using the comma, and we ask it to print it. So in this particular case, and I will distinguish from the previous one by adding a print line, and you can see the difference between those two lines. So what's happening in this case? This is a functional style Y. A, it's declarative, right? You say, what do you want to do? I want to filter, I want to map, I want to transform, I want to join. How do you do this? IDC, I don't care. Oh, encapsulated, right? I don't need to go into the detail right now. Secondly, the code begins to read like the problem statement. You sit down with the business analyst, and they're asking you, how does this code work? And if you're looking at the imperative style code, your blood is boiling already, right? And your business analyst says, what does this code do? And you say, that's what I'm trying to figure out. You shut up. That's how we feel, right? But the bottom code, the business analyst says, what does the code do? You say, dude, read it. It begins to read like the problem statement. You don't need to know how to write it, but it's readable. It's a complete opposite of what we talked about earlier. Imperative style code is hard to, easy to write, hard to read. Functional code is hard to write, because I'm not familiar with it, but easy to read. I can take this to anyone and say, just walk through it. I was visiting a client, and this guy said, I've been writing some code. Can you take a look at it and tell me what you think? Usually I'll freak out when somebody says this, because I don't know anything about their domain. And I said, sure. And he opens a code and shows it to me. This was in C sharp, nevertheless, right? Nice code using Lambda's link. And I literally started reading through the code, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm able to understand your business and domain knowledge and details here. You are saying I receive a shipment, and I'm doing this with my shipment, and I'm checking for these in the shipment. Even I can understand without knowing much about your domain. Imagine what somebody who understands your domain can do with this code. It is readable, right? So the code begins to read like the problem statement. That's the benefit you get from the functional style. So imperative style, you can say that in the case of imperative style, you can say that imperative style uh, is imperative style has higher accidental complexity. Functional style, you know, e flows like the problem statement. So as a result, uh, has less complexity, right? That is basically what you are going to get over here, right? So it has less complexity. So essentially, the idea is you want to reduce complexity. Simple problems need simple solutions. Complex problems need manageable solutions, not complex solutions. It's a complex solution if you're a consultant. It's a, it's a manageable solution if you want to solve the problem, right? So simple problems need simple solutions. Complex problems need manageable solutions. And if the code matches your domain details closely, it becomes easier to manage it, to maintain it, to change it. That's what you want to get to, right? So essentially, the idea here is that you want to enjoy that. So if this is where I want to stop my talk, let's say, if I want to say, thanks for coming, I hope you enjoyed it, what would, it, what would be the conclusion? We should all do functional programming? It's too bad you are doing imperative style. Oh my gosh, I won't sit next to you in the same table anymore. But life is not that simple, right? That's naive to be able to say that this is the right way and there's no better way. I'm so awesome, I found the right way. No, these are tools. And we have to ask the question, when is something a right tool? When is something not a right tool? Or maybe not a better tool? That's a question we want to ask. 
I will always have this in a conversation. When somebody sits to you and says, we want to do this. This is what I do every day. This is what I do with my children. This is what I do with my family. This is what I do with my colleagues. This is what I do with my friends. When they say they want something, I tell them, give me three things you like about it and tell me three things that are deficient about it. You got to give me both. If you can only give me three things that are great, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with it. What's that called? What was that? Ignorance. Ignorance, or even worse than ignorance, drinking the Kool-Aid. Ignorance can be cured, but drinking the Kool-Aid is hard to cure because I know this is the only best thing ever. Nothing else is great. Well, that's a very dangerous opinion and attitude to have, right? Because my way is the best way. There couldn't be any other way. Give me three why this is good. Give me three why this may not be good. If this is the only thing I can see, you're drank the Kool-Aid. And then, then the opposite, somebody. Hey, here are the reasons I really don't like this. Good. Three reasons why you don't like it. Three reasons why it's good. Oh, no way. What is that called? Ignorance, ignorance as well, but a bias. Biases are bad. How many times have you seen bias against people, against technology, against animals, against everything in life and, and lifeless? We carry biases with us. That's not good either. So always three things. What's good about it? What can be improved or what's not great about it? If we cannot bring that opinions to the table, we are carrying our ignorance, we are carrying our biases, we are being really overly, you know, uh, towards a, for, a particular approach or a technology or a person or a field. Hard to say. So what are the issues with functional style of programming? The number one thing to consider is the following. And to understand this, I'm going to show you an example. And the example here I'm going to show you is something I got an email from somebody. This person works for a financial company. A lot of our mutual funds, 401, if I say this, you may not sleep well tonight. Your 401k retirement fund is with this company. I cannot say the name. And, it's, and, a, and the programmer, with all respect, is a, is a good programmer. But here's the email he sent to me. He said, Venkat, here is a code I'm showing you a snippet of. And the code has hedge funds, and he's got a little pipeline, functional pipeline. And his email said this, Venkat, here's a code I've attached. This code worked fine until yesterday. It misbehaves this morning, from this morning. Help, what am I doing wrong? And I didn't have to take much time to read it. Because as I was reading the email text, I could feel the problem, what was in there. This is such a common problem. I've told many people, don't do this. And you know what was the most shocking thing? There was one morning I opened my source code, and in my source code was exactly the line of code I told people a thousand times, don't do it. All I can tell you is I walked away from the computer for a few minutes. I think the story of aliens being around is true, because I know never to write that code. And I'm the only person writing code on that project. How did it get in there? And that's the reason why this is dangerous knowing I shouldn't do it, and yet I had done it without realizing it. And I was in shock, literally shocked the next day when I saw it. But I'll show you the code. But here's a code to show you an example of this. So list, let's say, string results equal to new array list, which is empty, and then names, oh, <laughs> to make this a little bit more interesting, we'll print the results. But then I say, names.stream.filter, given a name, uh, name.length is equal to four, dot map, string to uppercase. Let's stop right there for a second. Is the code looking good? Is it a functional style? Is it a functional pipeline? Yeah. This code is going beautifully well until it comes to the edge of the cliff. 
and they didn't turn, they didn't apply the brakes, and they went right over. <gasps> the next, like, yeah, and there was no mark to catch. <laughs> there, was, there was no mark to catch. So right there, for each, uh, I heard the grounding over there. Result, sorry, name, result.add. I, I heard the sneeze as, I love these indicators programmers have, Mark. They write bad code, they sneeze. <laughs> they write bad code, they ground. So this is amazing, right? I love these feedback loops. So name. And you know what the worst thing is? You run the code, guess what? In this particular case, we're taking the name, and we say results.add, and we print the result. The worst thing is you run the code, and guess what happened in the code? You say a word. I quit using those words. These days, I don't say it worked. I say it behaves. That's all I can say, right? The code behaves. That's all I know. Which, which line in this code has a problem? What line number has a problem? No, the first, what, what problem? It worked. What, if there was a problem, what line number is the problem? 13, line 13. Can somebody tell me what's wrong with line 13? What did I do wrong in line 13? It's not mutation alone. Mutation is okay. Raise your hand if you have not mutated any variable in the code you have ever written. We just said everybody is wrong. Mutation is okay. Sharing is good. Remember what mom told us. You gotta share, kid. Sharing is good. Mutation is okay. Shared mutability is devil's work. Share, mutate, but never share your mutation. The problem in this line of code is shared mutability. What is it doing? It is taking this variable result and it is adding that value to it. Now the programmer who wrote to me saying the code worked fine until yesterday, it was not. But the code that worked until fine yesterday, it broke today, guess what the programmer did? That morning, that programmer wanted to make this code faster. So they turned this into a parallel stream. And then guess what happened when they ran the code? If you run this code a lot of times, you know, I, there are times when I would show how this code actually works. So let's, you know, just run this code a lot of times. Did it break already? Did it? So you run the code several times, and then you say, did we lose Nemo again? I couldn't have, demo gods are with me today, this morning, thank you. Because usually demos don't work like this, right? I always say, if you're lucky, the code fails on your machine. <laughs> if you're not lucky, it fails in production. You know when people tell you it works on my machine, that's no good. It fails on my machine, right? Then we got something to talk about. The problem with code like this is it is not working, right? So what do you do? You call your colleague, your colleague and say, excuse me, uh, could you tell me why this code doesn't work? And your colleague says, what's the problem? I ran it, it gave me the wrong results. Really? Run it again. What happens? It works. They're like, it works, but it didn't work before. Did it, are you sure? <laughs> well, when it doesn't work, call me, and they step away. And you run it, but it doesn't work. <laughs> now you gotta take a screenshot to show them, right? This is sad. So what's the model of the story here? The model of the story is the following. And the model of the story is, let's see if I can get back to the code. So model of the story is, make sure the functions are pure. 
the functions as in lambda expressions, right? And the functional pipeline are pure. So what is pure? Pure functions do not have side effects. They are, right, so they are idempotent. So what is idempotency? You keep calling them with the same input, they give you the same output. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna give you definition, rules for purity. When I talk about rule of purity, everybody says, of course, that's obvious for rule number one. Many have not thought about rule number two, which is kind of scary. Rule number one is necessary, but not sufficient. Rule two is essential. So what are those two rules? Here's my rules for purity. So what are the two uh, rules for purity? Rule number one and rule number two. A pure function, the function, does not mutate or change anything that is visible from the outside. I chose these words carefully. In my function, I will mutate something, and people will say, oh my gosh, it's not pure. Like, why? Why is it not pure? You're mutating something, so what's wrong? Who knows about this mutation? Nobody. Then what's wrong with it? So don't take concepts and not think about them and say, this is right, that's wrong. Mutation is okay, as long as nobody sees it. Let me ask you a question. I'm looking around the room, and I'm saying humbly, I'm very happy, this is a decent audience. Everyone has their top and the bottom. Nice group. Nobody is lax in their clothing, right? Very decent group. But I bet you, this morning, before you came here, you put on your clothes. Did you put your shirt first on or your pant first on? If you're a superman, you probably got both of them on at the same time. But did you put your shirt first or did you put your pant first? The answer is very simple. That's none of my business. But the good news is when I see you, you have both of those on. What I don't want to see is with one or the other not in there. That would be really a scary experience. So yes, you did have to change your clothing, but that's encapsulated. When I see you, you're decent, and that's all that matters to me. I don't care what you do within a function. That's your business. Mutate all you want, as long as I never see you mutating. That's the key, right? That's why it's a shared mutability. Function does not mutate or change anything that is visible. That's rule number one. Again, I did not say don't mutate. Don't mutate anything that's visible. So if you change something in the function, fine. But don't change it in a way I can see from the outside, encapsulation, right? Second, the function does not depend on anything from outside that may possibly change. There's rule number two, most people don't think about it. And they get surprised when they think about it afterwards. It doesn't depend on anything outside that may possibly change. I am in my function. And in my function, I'm using this variable up here. And I'm not changing it. But by the time I come to use it, you change it up there in another thread. What's going to happen to my function? Is it item potent? No. The result is dependent on the change to the variable outside. It cannot be pure. So see no evil. Cause no evil. In this case, side effect. Both are important. So you don't want to see the change happening. You don't want to be the one changing either. Now, you, would you agree that's a tall order, right? 
that's a lot more effort. It takes more effort to make functions pure. Because if you don't, what happens? If you don't make functions pure, your functional code will run fast, but may produce wrong results. Like we lost Nemo. Like my good friend working for the mutual fund company lost a few accounts during the parallel run. But he was lucky because he found the problem on his machine rather than in production and got to me quickly, right? So that's one thing. If your code has a lot of impurity in it, what's going to happen? You better be careful, right? So you have to have pure functions. You need to avoid side effects. You're saying, look, my code right in the middle of my computation needs to log, needs to write to a database, need to send out an email to the customers, needs to be able to send a request to a remote web service. Time out. Those are all side effects, isn't it? When you are sending a side effect, if in the middle of your computation, what happens? If you notify a client in the middle of an email in your functional pipeline, and when is it going to run? In what order is it going to run? If you perform logging, and what if you're causing a change to the database, and then you're coming back and reading it? What are going to be your results? The, the, the problem here is we got to be careful with Turing completion. Turing complete doesn't mean your code will perform to the best. Co Turing complete doesn't mean that your code is you know, completely without any errors. Turing completion simply says that the problem is solvable. And, and yes, imperative style is Turing complete, functional style is Turing complete. But what are the consequences of writing code like that? We got to ask ourselves the question. So in this case, if the code has side effects, logging, reading from database, writing to database, and going around and uh, talking to other microservices or web services or sending out emails, what do you do about those things? You have to be extremely careful about those. And then comes this beautiful concept of exception handling. What do you do with exceptions is the question, right? So let's, let's think about this for a minute. Suppose uh, when I'm writing this code in here, let's go back to you know, having these names. Let's say, just for the sake of discussion right here, if we have a function, let's say public, let's say static, string, transform, and I'm taking a trivial example here to illustrate this, and I'm going to say, return, let's say, name dot to uppercase, right? So I'm going to perform a transformation. But due to some issue, maybe there's a data that it doesn't really like. So for whatever reason, that's going to happen, right? So I'll simply say mat.random greater than 0 0.5. Maybe it's doing some kind of an operation that might result in an exception. Throw new IO exception and I'm going to throw some kind of a reason for it, right? So let's say we consider a code like this. So I'm going to go back here and say import java.io.io you know, .io exception. Let's start with that. So here I'm going to say a throws IO exception, right? So far, so good. So we have a throws IO exception. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to write this code in an imperative style. So I can say somewhat uh, for var names equal, uh, names uh, in names. And I could do something like this, right? I could define a result is equal to new array list of string as an example. And I can say result.add uh, transform the name. So far, so good. But you say, wait a second. This code won't compile. What's the problem? You need to handle IO exception, right? So what am I going to do to handle this IO exception? I can put a try. I can put a catch exception. Uh, even if you want an IO exception, I can do that. And then what am I going to say right after that? I can say, oh, if there was no exception, go ahead and add it. Maybe if there was an exception, I will print the message, right? Get message. 
and I'll print it. Again, this is a naive example, but mo mostly more complexities involved, but we're used to something like this, an imperative style of code, right? So you can run the code, and all of them failed, right? Uh, on the other hand, you can run the code, and you have more failures and reasons. So in this case, three failed and so on, and you can eventually print the result that you want to print after all those results. So that's imperative style code. We're used to handling exceptions in imperative style code, right? Everybody has done that. It's natural for us. But on the other hand, let's try to write this code in functional style. So let's comment that part out right there. And let's comment that out. And let's say names.stream dot map, and I'm going to call sample transform dot for each system dot out print line. And I'm going to write this a little bit more verbose to see the uh, details a little bit better. So transform name. Just to illustrate this, if you will not mind, please, let's do one thing. Before I run this code, let me go up here and remove the throws for a minute, just to illustrate the point for you. So let's go ahead and say, I don't have the exception, right? So no exception. I run the code, and what's going to happen in this case? When I run the code with names, you can see that it produced the output, right? The code worked, or OK, the code behaved, right? But I'm going to go back and put the exceptions right here. So throws IO exception. And over here, I'm going to remove the throw, uh, 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 put the throws exception. I run the code. What happened? It doesn't compile. What's the problem? Let me read this for you. Unsupported exception, IO, just carefully read it. Unsupported exception, IO exception, must be caught or declared to be thrown. Huh, must be caught or declared to be thrown. I can do that, right? So what are you going to do? You go back here and say, catch or, re, or, or declare to be thrown. I'll catch it. So catch IO exception. Output exception. Run the code. Look at the error message. Unsupported exception, IO exception. Must be caught or declared to be thrown. It has no empathy. You just did some coding. It didn't care. It says the same damn thing again. And you're like, really? So you're like, what does it mean? I did catch it. But if you look at it carefully, what was the problem? Undo the change and retry. The error is on line 31. Line 31, oops, the error is on line 31. It's a bit misleading. But the function it is talking about is not your main. The function it's talking about is the anonymous function, the lambda expression, isn't it? Now, when you see this error, there are two kinds of programmers. The first would say, hmm, let me think about it. The second says, let me show you how to work around it. And they will roll their sleeves, right? And so what do they do? And tell me, when I'm finished with this, tell me if you've ever seen people do this. So they say, no problem. The compiler is complaining. I'll tell you how to fix it. And what do they do? They go up here, and they remove that. <laughs> and then they say, a try. And then they say, a catch, IO exception. And then they say, throw new runtime exception. EX. Will the compiler complain at this point? No, because it's in shock. <laughs> Have you ever seen code like this before? A few of us are raising the hand. The others are just, they couldn't get over to raise the hand yet, right? When I see this code, I go to a corner, curl up, and cry for a few minutes. <laughs> and then I wipe my tears. And I come back and refactor the code. Yeah, see, so you can see him, right? That, that, I, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> code you saw last night, isn't it? Yeah. So 
is this a right approach? Does it feel like it's a right approach? Here's a question I want to ask you. Sometimes I, I use examples from the world in my, in my teaching. But this was nature in reverse. I never thought this would happen. I was in Boston, speaking at the Boston Java user group, the New England Java user group, amazing group. And my flight to Montreal was the next morning. I said, international flight, but a neighboring country, no big deal, I'm a freaking flyer. I don't need to really get excited about it. And I just stayed and partied with the group until late night. About 11 o'clock, I said, I'm going to go to bed. Well, the flight is about 6.30, no big deal. I'll leave from the hotel at 4 o'clock. I'm a frequent flyer. I'll be fine. At 4 in the morning, I start driving. 4.15, the road was filled with snow overnight, so I didn't know anything on the road. And on the road, I hit a poop, and the next thing you know, the car is not moving. So I stopped the car. And I got out and looked at the snow-covered road. My right front tire was busted. I'm like, oops, something I ran over, and, and it's punctured. And I'm like, oh, what do I do? I'm looking at the watch, 4.15 AM. And I have a flight at 6.30. I better get to the airport within the next you know, 30, 40 minutes. So I called the line number they had given. And the automated call said, your call is important to us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I'll, we'll get back to you in about three hours. No, not going to happen. My flight would be gone. I really wanted to be there to speak that morning. So I was thinking about it, and I said to myself, what do you do? I'm serious, I'm not even exaggerating when I say. I said to myself, what do you do in functional and reactive programming? You have a functional pipeline, right? You are in the functional pipeline. Something goes wrong. What do you don't do? You don't blow up the road and go to where, you don't, you don't tell a friend. Your friend says, hey, I'm on the freeway in the middle. I had a flat air, what should I do? If you don't want this person to be your friend ever again, tell them, put the car in reverse and drive in reverse to where you came from. Would that be a sensible thing to do? What do you tell them? My friend, safety is important. Carefully exit to the shoulder and always keep moving forward. But of course, I'm talking about driving in India, right? Doesn't make any sense. But the point really is, you tell people to keep moving forward all the time. That's what you're saying. And I thought about this honestly. I said, what do you do in functional reactive programming? If you're in a pipeline, deal with it downstream. I took a deep breath, turned on the ignition, put my foot to the pedal, drove all the way to the airport. As I entered the rental car facility, the few people working there at 5 in the morning heard this huge noise rolling in. And one, one person came to me and said, are, are you OK? I said, oh, I'm fine. Just a flat tire. Here's the key, by the way. And I just took off. And a few weeks later, my wife called me and said, I was on a trip, and she called me and said, remember that incident you said in Boston? I said, yeah. Well, they sent you a bill. <laughs> I said, let me sit down before you say what the amount is. Oh, they charge you $65. I can handle it. <laughs> Deal with it downstream. What you're going to do if you're doing functional programming is, let me state it in a different words. And this is where it becomes complex. And the answer is, exception. Handling, oops. So what I want to emphasize here is this. That exception, handling, is an imperative style of programming idea. Functional programming and exceptions are mutually exclusive. Do not throw exceptions in functional programming. Treat errors as a form of data and deal with them downstream. That's the sad part. You cannot throw exceptions from your code. You got to treat errors as a form of data. 
and you deal with them downstream. What that means is, in every step of your pipeline, you got to send a either object, where the either object has either a result or an error. So you go to the next level and say, here you go. It says, are you an error? Are you a data? If you are data, do this transformation. If you're an error, move it forward. Is that simple as we did before or more complex? What do you think? Is it same? Is it simple as just putting a filter map, reduce, and we are done? Or is it more work? Every level, you've got to handle more work, right? That's more work. You didn't just go home dealing with data. You got to keep asking, data, error, data, error. If you have to do more than one thing, that's called what in software design? Lack of cohesion. So your code is less cohesive when you start writing code like that. So the charm of functional programming diminishes. You got to do more work. You got to put in more effort. You got to structure the code differently. Your functions now have to deal with errors and data. And now you say, wait, that code was charming and beautiful and concise. What happened to all that beauty and conciseness? Yeah, a little less than what we had before. And what if you have multi-levels of exception you have to handle? That becomes even more complex. So. Functional programming is great, I love it, when your code has no side effect. When your code is completely pure. When you don't have to deal with exceptions. If I have to deal with those, what do I do? If you have impurity, writing functional style code doesn't make any sense because your results are gonna be incorrect. You have to work hard to remove that side effect, remove that impurity. If your code has exceptions, you can write code functionally by treating error as data, but the code is no longer simpler, and you need to be working a little harder to do that. So now we can ask the question, should I program functionally or imperatively? What's the answer? Beautiful, that's the answer. It depends. It depends on if you want to solve the problem or if you want to hang on to, there's one way to do things and that's the best way. And so what, how do you proceed with this? My first recommendation, don't be biased. Biases are bad, one way or the other. Don't be biased. It's okay, these are tools. There are many tools available. There are many ways to do things. I want to know what's the better way in this situation. Here, that might be a better way. Here, that may not be a better way. But I want to know which one is better given the context, given the situation. There are times imperative is good. There are times that functional style is good. And I need to be willing to choose it. But how do I choose it? The worst way to choose it is to say there is one way. The worst way to choose it is say that one way is better. The worst way to choose it is to argue about it. Prototype it. Prototype both solutions. One prototyping is equal to a million words. The minute you sit and prototype both ways, you can go to a colleague and say, excuse me, can you take a look at these? and tell me what you think about these two solutions. Now we have something concrete to work with. We can look at the code and say, here are the pros, here are the cons. And now you ask your colleague, can we collectively come up with three things we like, bless you, and three things we don't like? Then you can choose based on the real comparison rather than carrying our biases.
Hope that was useful. Thank you.